everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation on clean cooking. I am delighted so many of you are joining us today to celebrate 10 years of impact on this critically important issue. My name is Dimfna van der Lans, and I am the CEO of the Clean Cooking Alliance. Before we get started in our conversation with our two distinguished guests, I thought I would provide a little bit of background for those of you who are less familiar with this topic. It is hard to imagine in this day and age where we have space tourism, artificial intelligence, and remote meetings such as the one that we're partaking in today, and yet half of the world's population still cooks over polluting open fires using solid fuels. Millions of people across the world still cook as our ancestors did centuries ago, using um, open fuels or open fires and inhaling toxic smoke, filling their lungs and polluting the air. This is unacceptable. The impacts of cooking this way are significant and touch all of us. The World Health Organization has estimated that about 4 million people die prematurely every year from cooking this way. Using open fires use, um, produces huge amounts of climate gases. About half of the world's black carbon emissions come from cooking this way. Women and girls spend hours cooking and collecting fuels, time they could have spent on other activities. And the unsustainable use of fuels leads to deforestation and environmental degradation. As I said, this is unacceptable. And this is where clean cooking comes in. We envision a world where no one's life is limited by how they cook. We envision a world where homes are no longer filled with toxic fuels and toxic fumes. We envision a world where children are able to go to school because they don't have to collect firewood. About a decade ago, a global movement started to do justice. Through our work, we are enabling hundreds of millions of families to use clean cooking solutions, stoves, appliances, fuels, just like we do in our own kitchens every single day. The benefits of this transition are multiple and really significant. By using clean cooking solutions, we improve lives, we improve air quality, we protect our environment, and we empower women around the world. I am honored today to be joined by two visionary leaders who were fundamental in the establishment of this global movement. First, let me introduce Secretary Clinton. As you all know, Secretary Clinton is a former Secretary of State from the UN United States. She has been a really tireless advocate for social justice and social issues, including clean cooking. And she was fundamental in the establishment of the Clean Cooking Alliance about, as we were just talking, about 11 years ago now. Secondly, I'm really honored to introduce Wanjira Matai, who is the Vice President and Regional Director of Africa for the World Resources Institute. Wanjira is also the chair of the Wangari Matai Foundation, as well as the former chair of the, Glo of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. She also has been a tireless advocate for social and environmental change. I am personally just so honored to be with both of you. You have inspired my uh, career and continue to motivate me every single day to do this important work with the Clean Cooking Alliance. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Secretary Clinton and Mandira. Um, we will spend as much time as we possibly can really looking forward, which I think is important. It's a really important decade this year. And so the last 10 years have had significant impact and we're, we're celebrating that. But we also want to start thinking about what else can we do collectively to really address this issue at the scale that's required. But before we do that, I always feel it's important to acknowledge what has been done before and how things started because it's easy, relatively speaking, for me to do the good work that my team does, but it's only because of all the good work that has been done by others before us. And so I want to start with you, Secretary Clinton, if that's okay. I can envision that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when you started to bring this issue to the attention of global leaders, business leaders, scientists, there may have been some resistance and some reluctance to engage on this issue. Can you share a little bit with us what those challenges were and why you decided to pursue despite some of these challenges? 
Well, first, thank you, Dimpna, for hosting us today and, and for your leadership of the Clean Cooking Alliance. I am grateful to you for you know, keeping this uh, momentum going. And it's always a pleasure to see uh, my longtime friend and colleague, uh, Wanjira. So I'm really pleased to be part of this. Let's go back 11 years. And uh, I think now it's um, perhaps hard to appreciate uh, what, a, uh, what a, a lightning bolt it was uh, for me and those with whom I worked to realize that there was something we could do that would be uh, good for climate change, uh, good for health, good for women's empowerment. And it had to do with the most basic activity of life, namely cooking. Um, it was brought to my attention when I was Secretary uh, of State that, uh, as you just said, Dimpna, the amount of damage done by cooking over open fires, largely using solid fuels, uh, to uh, the health of primarily women and children. Uh, in fact, uh, respiratory ailments uh, were in the top five causes of global deaths that were directly related uh, to the consequences of such cooking, that it was a major emitter uh, of uh, gases that were problematic for the climate, for the immediate environment because of the pollutants that were in the air. And it was a huge time commitment by women and children, again, uh, to gather fuel uh, to be able to make a meal uh, for the family. So when we came forward with our uh, interest in this, there was already some work being done. It wasn't really at global scale yet, but there were um, scientists, advocates, uh, some decision makers, certainly um, people who were aware of the health consequences who had been trying to gather attention uh, for us to address this. And because we were able to convince uh, within my own government, not just the State Department, but USAID, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, to really elevate this issue. Uh, we were uh, then uh, able to work with like-minded, uh, interested governments and not-for-profits and advocates uh, to try to put together a global response. And the final thing I'll say as, as just an introduction is there was pushback. Um, you referred to that. There were people who are very well-meaning and quite um, in, intent upon uh, raising living standards, uh, raising health standards, uh, who did not see it as a big problem, who questioned the science, uh, who raised all kinds of um, you know, skepticism about why the United States government would be making this a high priority. But we kept working on it. We kept pushing back and we were able to get a united front and then uh, take that message uh, to governments. And there were some very receptive uh, governments and policymakers who looked at the same data, had the same, you know, almost revelation that this is something that is uh, really good on so many fronts and joined in our efforts. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it'd be really interesting when we go a little bit further in our conversation, Secretary Clinton, because we see the same thing happening again um, in the United States government. So it's it's really good to see that sort of intra-government coordination re-emerging as a theme, which is critically important for issues like clean cooking. Anjira, a little bit of the same question for you. Um, you have been working on this for decades, um, just I'm really focused on environmental protection and, and making sure that women are empowered to have their voices heard as they're thinking about these issues. So can you share a little bit with us and with the audience about how that started and, and really what some of the challenges were that you overcame? Absolutely. And also, you know, joining Secretary Clinton, such a pleasure, a privilege, because actually, to be honest, the, the clean cooking issue as a global issue was really introduced to me by her. She <laughs> was launching the Clean Cooking Alliance 11 years ago. I grew up in Kenya all my life in many ways, sitting around these fires. I, I was in my grandmother's house every Easter or every Christmas, and we would sit around these fires. They were the 
they warmed the house, they were the source of ambient uh, temperature warming, but also that's where we cooked. We cooked, we roasted potatoes in them, we, we roasted bananas. It never really occurred to me that it was dangerous in the way that I was now starting to hear. And so it was, it's such an important point that so many of us grew up, who grew up in Africa, who grew up in Asia, who grew up in these circumstances, it is almost its norm. We cook like this. We live in these circumstances. And until it's pointed out that there is some connection to the indoor air pollution, to the number of children dying early, mm -hmm. to the number of uh, pneumonia cases, you don't quite appreciate it. So it really was an important uh, opening that it became this global call to action. And so it wasn't until I was leading W Power as a, the Partnership for Women's Entrepreneurship that I realized it is actually quite prolific. It's not a mm -hmm. small number that mm -hmm. in Kenya, 90% of Kenyans are cooking using biomass energy. That surprised me. I thought it was a marginal number. And so it was only then that I realized the scale of it, the scale of it. And at the same time, I started to appreciate the danger of it. And then, of course, we started to look at what are some of the, the alternatives? Why is it so compelling? That's a really important question. Why is cooking on open fire so compelling? And how can we introduce or, or transition from this in a way that doesn't rob people of what they actually love about it? There's a way yeah. people, there are certain preferences people have. And so I loved W Power because it was about looking closely at what, how do we do this in a way that's dignifying, in a way that maintains what women love about cooking around these fires, the solidarity, the warmth, the, yeah. the multiple flavors that come out of cooking like this. And that we don't just come and say, hey, get rid of this and here's something I brought for you to use. So it was a very, um, a very thoughtful movement that was being yeah. set up that I really, really appreciated. Yeah, absolutely, Vantura. And I, I think the, the notion that the solutions that are brought to um, the families and the communities that we're reaching have to be focused on the user and to assume that we know what it is that they want is the wrong assumption. And so the, the, the fundamental part, I think, of the King Cooking Alliance and how we think about this is it has to be user centered and the, the solutions that are provided have to be focused on the user. Because if not for that, then the, the, the skill is never going to be achieved. And so my other question for you, Secretary Clinton, is really on the fact that you advocated to use a market based approach, which is also grounded in like the solutions have to be for the users and need to be really commercially driven as well, because otherwise we're not going to reach that skill. And so at that time, that was quite a unique approach. Can you share a little bit more about what made you decide to to really push for that market-based um, approach for clean cooking specifically? Oh, sure. And and I just wanted to add to um, the very important point Wajira made was this has to be culturally uh, educated. You know, just as she said, uh, ninety percent of Kenyans are using open fire cooking. Uh, the way that they do it in Kenya may not be the way they mm -hmm. do it in rural India or the way that they do it in, uh, you know, a small village in China or Indonesia. I mean, right. we, we have to be really aware of what the, you know, families and the women uh, in those families uh, want from that experience. Um, you know, you know, when you think about um, this, this movement, uh, and we began trying to figure out what do we do? I mean, it's it's a huge problem. I mean, you've got, yeah. you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions, uh, probably billions of people uh, who uh, cook this way. And it, it's, it, there's no one size fits all. So we wanted to encourage um, a market-based approach because we thought the market in Kenya would be different than the market in mm -hmm. China. Um, and so, one of the things that I've seen over the course of the last 11 years in my travels is the different kinds of models that have been uh, created uh, by um, inventors, uh, by, you know, a lot of uh, 
people who understand there could be a market and are trying to help uh, fill it uh, because it all looks different. I remember going to a, an exhibit in China when I raised yeah. this issue with them and encouraged them to take it on. Uh, and they had about uh, two dozen different models mm -hmm. for different climates, for different altitudes, for different kinds of fuel. And I think that is the most lasting approach. Now, clearly, the cost has to be uh, as low as possible. And very often, there will have to be some kind of subsidy or long-term payment plan for uh, a family to afford both the, uh, the device and uh, the fuel. Uh, so th this turned out to be a, a complicated, uh, diverse problem that we had to address mm -hmm. and try to make it as localized as possible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, one of the things that the Clean Cooking Alliance is um, pursuing as a new initiative is this user insight lab that will also really build on the availability of data. And as all of we know, like there's so much more data available now and really innovative ways and, and increasingly cheaper ways to actually collect the data and use that to make informed decisions about solutions that are appropriate. So one of the new initiatives that the Alliance um, will launch soon is really focused on the user insight lab because of all the things that both of you were just um, illustrating as well. Um, if it's okay with both of you, I would suggest we move on a little bit to talk about the impact that actually has been achieved since Secretary Clinton and you, Vandira, started really focusing on this issue about 11 years ago and what a journey it has been, um, ups and downs undoubtedly, but that's part of what makes this work really fascinating and rewarding as well. Um, and so I'm sure you've seen the recent numbers from the World Health Organization as well as from um, CCA is our own um, site that really focuses on the 10 years of impact. Well over 400 million people who now have access to clean cooking, more than 4.6 million lives saved, massive reductions in harmful climate gases, and countless women and girls who've been empowered through training, jobs, plus the gift of extra hours and extra time that they can spend on other things. And then combined with that, significant economic benefits that have been delivered to families, communities, and governments across the world. And so, Secretary Clinton, we've come a long way since 2010. Um, what is it like to see for you to see this, this impact and the results of your work um, that, together with so many others, really is coming to fruition? Well, those statistics are are truly uh, inspiring. Uh, as you say, Dipna, uh, over uh, 400 million people have gained access to clean cooking. And the statistic about the lives saved, mm -hmm. 4.6 uh, million uh, from the harmful health effects attributed uh, to um, traditional household air pollution, is especially pertinent as we come out of this pandemic because 4.6 million people is about the number we've lost globally in the pandemic. And we were having a silent pandemic of people getting sick and dying from indoor air pollution, from breathing the particulates over open fires, both indoors and outdoors as they cooked or sat around the fire. So I think it puts into perspective what a an accomplishment it has been to save those lives over this period of time. And, and something I'd love for Wanjira to talk about, because she and her mother uh, have been such champions of this, it, there's also the whole question of deforestation, which mm -hmm. we haven't mentioned because you know most people, most women who are going out looking for fuel are looking for twigs. They're looking for you know, some kind of uh, tree um, mass that they can then uh, transport. Obviously, they can use dung, they use other mm -hmm. biomass, but, you know, a lot of the uh, deforestation that has gone on has certainly been in part uh, contributed to by people looking for fuel to start the fires to feed uh, their families. And the fact that in addition to the 400 million now having access to clean cooking, 
and the 4.6 million lives that have been saved, you know, probably a couple, you know, many millions of trees have been saved as well. So there's a, there's so much positive outcome already. Um, and, and I think from Wanjira's perspective, being on the ground uh, in Kenya and across Africa with all the work that she's done, um, you know, she can see firsthand uh, those results. Wanjira? Absolutely. You know, such a good point, Secretary Clinton, on the on the deforestation. I'm always struck by the fact that it's not even about women who are picking the twigs and picking small branches. It's just the demand for charcoal that, for example, has created this um, market demand for, for charcoal that is in many ways illegitimate. An illegitimate market has just forced illegal logging to continue instead of creating opportunities, for example, for, for fuel farming, farming of trees in different places and not necessarily the cutting of indigenous trees in conservation areas to burn them for charcoal. I think that has been the real tragedy of this because in many ways, we know how important charcoal is for many people's cooking. And even as that fuel continues to be transitioned out in that transition period, we need to have it more organized, much better organized and legitimized so that women can continue. They are the, the real custodians of seeds and they would continue to grow these trees, but not, on, not in conservation areas, they would produce charcoal trees for those who need them, fuel trees for those who need them, and reduce the pressure on our conservation areas. That has been a true driver of deforestation. And the, the main reason is because it is illegitimate. And you have a lot of um, what we call artisanal logging that is just not, not um, uh, necessary. It, it can be managed, it can be controlled. So absolutely a big, big driver. But I, I have to add, Dimfna, that I'm also really excited by those numbers. I'm in particularly excited about the innovations in technology, how far we've come, where we now have options for women to consider that were never there before. Uh, I know that W Power was really important in helping spotlight the role of women. We have a lot more women in, involved, not only as users of these technologies, but also in the design of the technologies, in the marketing of these technologies. And we know how important it is when women have money in their pockets, 80% of that gets plowed right back into their communities. And so, so important that they are part of this uh, market system. It was a genius, I think, to create a market mechanism for this because it just didn't exist. And that was it's a big success story for the Cooking Alliance that you're able to trigger supply and demand and begin to create mm -hmm. and innovate around that. That was a really important part of, of the, I think the first part success. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for those businesses that are really focusing on innovation, both on the technology and the business model side and their ability to incorporate the voices of women throughout the supply chain, all the way to the end user. We see so many inspiring stories right now um, and really some good progress that is being made by those uh, those companies right now. And, and if not for those companies, we will never get to the skill that's required to address the issue. So collectively, the whole ecosystem needs to continue to support these companies. Um, and we're honored to be able to do so. Um, Secretary Clinton, maybe a, a, another question for you, just on the role of government, like how important in those last 10 years has has the role of government really been both on the donor side, but also in um, Africa and Asia and South and Central America, where, where a lot of the work happens? What do you see has been really how they've showed up and, and, and who are the leaders? Well, you know, the, um, the interesting thing um, about this movement, and I like to think of it as a movement because <laughs> it's... Uh, certainly a market, but there wouldn't be a market if there hadn't been a movement. So I think uh, governments have key roles to play. I'm, I'm very proud that our government stepped up 11 years ago. We had a, uh, a, a hiatus for four years, but we're back in the game now. And the Biden-Harris administration has made clean cooking uh, a, a pillar of their, their climate policy. And uh, we'll be advocating uh, for uh, this uh, approach, along with others, obviously, 
at the COP26 uh, meeting in uh, Glasgow, Scotland later this year. But other countries, um, Norway uh, has been uh, very supportive. Canada has been supportive. The Netherlands has been supportive. Uh, they've all been uh, encouraging through their uh, their their donor programs, um, their their uh, policy arms that uh, clean cooking be uh, a part of their climate, their health, and their women's empowerment agendas. Uh, the UK has also done some work here, and other countries have been internally focused. I, I said China uh, had been, you know, willing to begin to address this when I was Secretary of State. I visited a display of clean cook stoves in India uh, about, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. I lose track of time, but a couple of years <laughs> ago, and I saw the different models that they were uh, looking at to adopt on a state-by-state uh, -state, uh, basis. So government has played an absolutely crucial role I would like to see more governments involved. I'd like to see more governments um, in, as you say, Central and South America, Africa, Asia, you know, step up and join, uh, not just in name, but in real commitment, uh, the Clean Cooking Alliance. And it, it's a perfect time to do this leading up to COP26. Yeah. And you know, maybe you could say more about that because we want to recruit countries. We want to recruit businesses, corporations, not-for-profit groups and advocates to be looking at what we have to urgently do to address climate change. And sometimes people at the local level, I mean, you know, both of you know this very well, they think the problem is too big. They don't think there's anything they can do. But indeed, there is something that can be done. And clean cooking could be one of those uh, uh, individual actions that would make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, the recent announcement that you were referring to, Secretary Clinton, from the U.S. government, specifically through the EPA, really focuses on exactly that. So we're fortunate enough to be able to work with countries across the world to make sure that clean cooking is really ambitiously embedded in their national determined contributions as they think about the climate impacts and their implementation plans over the next um years and so part of our work going forward is to really work with those countries on their NDCs um, and make sure that they are able to deliver against us because it's as we all know it's sometimes easy to put ambitions into a certain commitment but it is much more difficult to implement that and then to find the funding to actually do execute against those commitments and so the Clean Cooking Alliance is really honored to be working on something that we're calling delivery units that will allow countries in those regions to almost like you did 11 years ago, Secretary Clinton, have like a, a unit within a government whose only job it is to just focus on clean cooking, which currently does not exist. And so we're really looking to make sure that across the globe, other countries have that ability to execute their plans as well. Bonjira, um, the role of NGOs, um, I always, you and I both work in one, obviously, um, and I think we increasingly see it's really good, strong leadership there um, from the NGO sector as well. So I wondered if you could share a little bit about your observations around specifically NGOs roles as it relates to clean cooking. Right. I mean, this is, as you've mentioned, uh, an all of society. Uh, everyone's needed, right? So I think one of the things that's exciting is, is perhaps what we're doing together uh, with the Clean Cooking Alliance and, and launching this new Clean Cooking Explorer. You know, WRI has, uh, you know, as a research organization, developed a lot of tools that can be leveraged. And the Energy Explorer is one that we're going to be trying to see if we can uh, leverage for clean cooking. One of the things that's true about any issue, and, and the vaccine situation is the same, the last part is always the hardest these are it is there is a reason we are dealing with these this decade will be even harder than the last because now we are dealing with some of the most difficult we have to be more thoughtful we have to be more granular about what what is needed and so the clean cooking explorer is going to be part of helping us use technology like gis and and others to understand the insights user insights as we mentioned and barriers to adopting clean cooking, to be able to interpret, to visualize, to look at exactly why and how 
and who are accessing um, cooking technologies, what sort of technologies, what are their preferences? What are the barriers ar yeah. along the supply chain? Because as you mentioned, especially with policy, you can have all the beautiful policies in the world and you can have my head of state, President Kenyatta will sign very happily that he supports this. But when you go and look, you find there are import barriers that prevent manufacturers from actually bringing in the necessary raw materials to produce and to keep costs low. We have to, these delivery units will be crucial in looking honestly at what the supply chains look like and trying to help bring those um, to check. And so we're excited that the Alliance and, and the WRI can begin to pioneer a tool like this because it will bring us a little bit broader knowledge and more understanding of what's needed. Great. No, absolutely. Thank you, Vandira. And I cannot tell you how often the companies that we're working with will continue to remind me that what they need is a predictable policy environment. It should not change out of the blue all of a sudden. And so varying degrees of success, I think, there on how predictable those policy environments currently are for entrepreneurs who are really trying to do the hard work and, and are struggling to meet their, their increase their margins. And so the predictability of that policy environment is one that we continue to say like really needs to be put forth front and center for the, the governments as well. Um, if it is okay with um, both of you, I'll transition a little bit more towards the next decades of action. Um, as you both know, this is an incredibly important year for clean cooking. We have the high level dialogue on energy that is um, taking place in September, where lots of organizations have already been really focused on um, how to prepare for that high level dialogue on energy, the first time that it's happening in decades um, at the UN level. So a really critical moment. We have COP26, as Secretary Clinton was already referencing earlier, where we're hoping to see increased commitments around climate as it relates to um, clean cooking. And so this is an opportunity for momentous progress, I think, um, on climate protection, on health, on the environment, on women's empowerment. And so really want to spend a little bit of time with both of you looking forward to see what else could be done to make sure that we continue this momentum, but even more importantly, actually build on it and, and really strengthen the movement um, that was started 10 years ago. And so maybe Secretary Clinton, if I can start with you, what else do you think is needed to be more effective because as you both have been alluding it is a wide ecosystem with lots of players in it and collaboration and coordination is key but what else do you think secretary clinton could organizations like myself do to make sure that we continue the way that we're doing right now well i am going to um, hold up your report because i hope that everyone watching us uh, there's wonderful statements from both uh, Wanjira and Dipna in this report. Uh, it's a 2021 clean cooking industry snapshot from the Alliance. And in it, uh, there is both an excellent analysis of mm -hmm. where investment is currently going uh, and a set of recommendations about how we better coordinate our approach. And I just want to refer to this because uh, those who are interested in this issue, the work that is being done by the Clean Cooking Alliance gives us a roadmap, a, mm -hmm. a path forward. So for example, um, we, we definitely need, as uh, we just heard, to better integrate this uh, issue into governments. Mm -hmm. uh, there needs to be a, a commitment, as Wanjira said, from literally the top down to the local level that this will be a priority because it is such a, an important contribution in dealing with a lot of problems that you know, countries and communities are facing. Um, and so the, uh, the, the recommendation that was just made by DIPNA that you know, create and resource governmental clean cooking, quote, delivery units innovation, I wholly endorse because yeah. If, you know, when I found that I was doing this work 11 years ago, if, if we hadn't had dedicated people in the State Department pushing the rest of our government, there would have been interest. I think people, as Wanjira said, would have said, oh yeah, great idea, but there wouldn't have been the constant day-to-day -day, uh, effort to make sure we were doing things, that we were trying to deliver results. I also think 
in the private sector, and this is something the two of you know uh, a lot about, how do we make how do we make this attractive for more inventors and companies to invest? Mm -hmm. How do we get people thinking like they're now thinking like, how do we make solar energy more portable, you know, make make it uh, smaller, mm -hmm. make it more efficient? Mm -hmm. Well, how do we get more people thinking about cook stoves? How do we get more businesses, mm -hmm. more inventors? Mm -hmm. I would love to see um, a, a lot mm -hmm. of I can't. Uh, I want to almost hear. like a contest, you know, like a contest for the best and with some, you know, mm -hmm. with some prizes attached for the best designs. Again, we would need like four or five winners because there's so many different uh, conditions that clean cooking uh, takes place in. I think also if we can get some strong statements coming out of international organizations like we got out of the WHO, because as as you both know, there was debate about whether it was really a health problem. And there were people who were on both sides of the issue when I thought the data was pretty clear, but there were all kinds of questions. And then when the WHO said, no, this is a, this is a health problem that causes, you know, chronic conditions and even death, we were able to break through. So I think we need international organizations to talk about why this is a part of climate um, and yeah. change uh, reactions. This is a part of, def you know, ending, uh, you know, charcoal creation. We, we need a, a much bigger global uh, tension uh, focused on this and countries, uh, businesses and others, you know, making it part of their um, uh, commitments. Obviously, we need more financial resources. Um, we need these markets, not just to be in urban areas, but out in rural areas where most of the cooking is going on. Uh, so I think if you are really focused on what we need to do in order to hit our goals for 2030, um, you know, th this, this uh, report gives you uh, a good idea of where you might fit in to make uh, a difference. Absolutely. And a quick shout out to the team who created that report. Um, I know, as a matter of fact, that it is one of the most valuable tools and, and publications that we produce right now. And, and lots of people in the ecosystem really refer to this tool. So a big shout out to my team who works really tirelessly on producing these reports and we do it every year. Um, I think that the whole suggestion, um, Secretary Clinton, around this whole systems approach, like really being very clear about what different roles, different parts of the ecosystem play so that we collectively and transparently are moving forward in the right way, really led the Clean Cooking Alliance several months ago to initiate and, and launch this clean cooking systems strategy work, where we don't create a strategy just for us as an organization, but our intention is to create it for the whole sector. And so some of the things that I was sharing earlier, the initiatives that are coming out of that are really being now taken up by not just us, but by multiple partners, including one that's really going to focus on the role that carbon finance plays. And I want to check with you, Anjira, a little bit because there is a real opportunity, I think, now to make clean cooking projects tremendously attractive for carbon financing. There are some hurdles that I think there's some noise in the system occasionally that it gets seen as like too small, too insignificant. A little bit what you've heard 11 years ago, Secretary Clinton. And so your thoughts on what we can collectively do to make sure that clean cooking is seen as a good climate solution with appropriate carbon financing through RBF facilities and the like. Right. No, well done. I mean, I think that I agree that's a tremendous report and, and it really does highlight so much of what has gone well and certainly the opportunities. I think that I would have to say the clean cooking sector has been one of the beneficiaries of the carbon markets in, in demonstrating in particular that it is possible to track, to monitor, to quantify um, the benefits of clean cooking and the savings and, and the reduced emissions. So I think that it's just the scale and the scale is, 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 is a commitment that we have to make to make that work. And I think unlike in, for example, the forestry sector, we're still trying to convince people that it is a sector that is worth, worth making, you know, carbon, a carbon market around that is global. 
this sector, I think, is, is much further ahead. So I, I would say, Dimpna, it is a scale, it is largely underfunded, and you cannot have large scale projects if it's this underfunded. And uh, Secretary Clinton, you mentioned, we have to make this important for not only climate, for development. We will not meet our sustainable development goals if we don't meet this one. This is about energy, it's about poverty, it's about environment, it cuts across so many of the development goals. And then of course you have the big climate agenda. We have to cut our emissions globally. And this is one area where the developing world, even if we are, even though we are so considered low emitters, this is an emission uh, sector that is killing people. And so we have to put our energy on this as well. So it is a crucial one for this decade this decade of action. So I do not see us, if we're serious and certainly the system strategy will work. And I love that you're working with sustainable energy for all and looking at this as an entire system strategy, the NDC agenda, how do we bring that in so that it is a national policy agenda as well? Those will be crucial elements of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and what I've really found fascinating in the last maybe six months or so is the ability that we now have to bring other organizations, as you were saying, Secretary Clinton, global organizations into this conversation. And so, for example, we are now regularly speaking with the World Trade Organization, with IMF, with UNICEF, with unlikely organizations that previously would not have thought about clean cooking as an issue for them to consider because in a way it's maturing and, and it allows us to reach a different kind of audiences including the integrate or the international energy agency like it's a different space right now um, that clean cooking is moving into that is really exciting and i think sets us up for some tremendous progress in the next 10 years um including really the the connection between the role that electricity has and clean cooking at a household level and to no longer separate those out it's like an artificial separation the siloing of energy needs for families that hasn't helped us at all and so we're really encouraged to see that show up increasingly um, when we meet and, and, and talk with our partners across the world. So um, I am personally really encouraged about the next 10 years, and I hope both of you are. And yes, indeed, I will um, read my own reports very carefully, Secretary Clinton, to make sure that we follow through on those. But I am just really so honored to have spent time with both of you. I'm conscious that we're getting close to um, having to wrap up. So with your permission, I was wondering if you think about the audience here, like maybe one other thing that you would encourage our viewers to do as they've listened to this conversation, um, as they internalize this important issue and that, that it is possible to collectively address that. Secretary Clinton, anything you would share with our audiences as what they can do after this conversation? Well, I, I think um, you've heard uh, from all of us that there are actions each and every one of you can take. Uh, you can uh, make your uh, interest in clean cooking known to elected officials, to government leaders, uh, to the heads of corporations. However, you can communicate that uh, through letters online in any way that is available to you. I think going online and talking about this conversation, raising the visibility of the importance of clean cooking to the environment, to our fight against climate change, to empowering women, to ending deforestation, uh, to helping people live healthier lives, to ending unnecessary deaths. I mean, this is such a, uh, a, a complicated but rich uh, problem for you to help us address. And then, of course, if you are uh, inventive, uh, study the different kinds of models that are being produced about clean cooking. Uh, maybe you've got a better idea. Maybe you could come up with something that would uh, make a difference. So I, I just hope that people will use their voices, use their shared experiences, use their level of commitment uh, to contribute, to support in whatever way possible, uh, the work of the Clean Cooking Alliance and all the work it's doing around the world to deliver clean cooking to hundreds of millions of more families so that the 400 million we've done the last 10 years becomes, you know, 
a billion in billion. the next 10 years, right? Yeah. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. Bonjour. Wow, uh, Secretary Clinton has mentioned uh, crucial pieces and I wanna build on the one she said about education. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Wangai Mathai Foundation does is work with young people and, and inspire young people to be responsive, to be attentive to what their community needs and what their communities need. And that we must see, Africa is largely a young continent. Apparently the average age of Africans today is 19 years old. Can you believe that? So there are a lot of young people who are going through our education system. And as they do that is our educators to begin to make this an agenda for young people to be attentive to, to begin to respond to how we cook in our homes and how we begin to inspire them into careers in, in engineering and in others that will begin to touch on this issue from an early age, that we begin to sensitize young people to see, because half the time people just don't see this as a problem. I'm one of those examples, I was in it and I didn't necessarily see it as a problem. And be, to see it as a problem when you're in it is to be very responsive and thoughtful because you won't eliminate the parts you like. You'll come up with solutions that incorporate what you like about the cooking arrangements that we have. And I think that way we'll have true transformation. And so how do we build a system where young people begin to be introduced to this from an early age? I think this is gonna be a real transformative change. Yes, absolutely, Vandir. I think you and I should talk about a potential partnership with UNICEF to do exactly that. <laughs> so I will follow up with you afterwards. Um, as we wrap up, um, the Clean Cooking Alliance recently launched an award-winning um, social media campaign um, that is focused on making sure that all our partners and, and everybody in our ecosystem is increasingly aware of the issue of clean cooking. It's called Clean Cooking Is. And so um, if that is okay, Secretary Clinton, can I ask you to finish the sentence, clean cooking is, and then Wanjira, if you could do the same, um, that would be fantastic. Oh, there's so much to choose from. Um, clean cooking is empowering women and girls. Wanjira? Clean cooking is a life and death situation. Address it now. Great. Well, thank you both so very much. It's been just an honor and a pleasure to spend time with both of you today. Um, thank you for the audience for listening. Um, and please reach out, obviously, to the Clean Cooking Alliance if you do want to get involved, if you do want to get engaged or, or engage with us on this critically important issue. And as I said, for both of you, continue to be inspired. And I look forward to 10 more years of wonderful impact as we collectively make sure that no one's life is limited by how they cook. So thank you both. Thank you so much, Nipta, Wanjira. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimpna. Thank you, Secretary Clinton.